My name is Red. I'm a research analyst at Masari, and I will let our panelists introduce themselves. Um, hi, I'm Dalton. I'm the lead engineer at Fleek. Hello, my name is Matt Hamilton. I'm a developer advocate working for Protocol Labs. I, the company, you probably know us more for IPFS and Filecoin, so decentralized storage. Hi, I'm Ben Golub. I'm the CEO of StoreJ, which is also enterprise grade decentralized storage. Um, I've been with the company for about six years, and uh, prior to that, I was uh, CEO of Docker uh, and a few other companies uh, in the infrastructure space. So I've, I've been Web 1, Web 2, and now Web 3. Right, you've made your way around. So to start out with a question, I'm going to bluntly say we need adoption. Why should I care? I'm asking this as a user. Why should I care about Deepin? Why do I want to use this instead of Web 2? As a user, I don't think you should care. I think you should care that what you're getting is something that's more secure, more private, uh, more affordable, uh, more durable. And if we can deliver that, then you should use it. And decentralization and deep pin is a way that we can deliver better solutions to the end user. And I think for the most part, the end user and even the enterprise customers are not going to care that it's decentralized. It would be great if they did, but we have to do something that's fundamentally better. And use decentralization as a way to achieve that. Yeah, I think that's a good point there, is that to, to an end user, decentralization in and of itself is not really a driver, right? The price, the quality, the features, the, all of those things are, are the real drivers as to why they should care. In most cases, decentralization of, in its, of itself is never really apparent or never really an issue until something goes wrong, until your account gets closed, until you get banned or censored or you know deleted or whatever it is. That's when suddenly it's like, oh, now I care about this, right? So for the majority of users, they're not going to care. I mean, we obviously we'd like them to care because that's the stuff we're involved with, right? Um, but I, I think the reality is, yeah, it's it's like decentralization. The, the D of D pin on its own is not, in most cases, really enough to make them care. We need to be talking about other value adds. So like on on you know Filecoin. Yes, it's decentralized, it's you know, cheaper than other things, but things like the fact that it is tamper-proof, right? The fact that you can, you know, data is stored using content addressing, it's hashed, you can tell whether something you stored 10 years ago has not been altered. That is something that is potentially more uh, valuable than just the decentralization in and of itself. Um, yeah, I think they really hit the nail on the head with that. I mean, I don't think the end user does need to care. I think what the end user cares about is, um, is it working, is it fast, is it cheaper? And I think that's what we can use DPIN is to build products like that. Um, I think in a lot of ways we can be faster and cheaper. Um, I do think there is something to be said. Some users might care uh, if they're buying into the ethos of a project and this decentralized protocol has a centralized Cloudflare or centralized point of failure right in the front. And I think there is certain type of users that would care that, about things like this that we can replace with alternatives. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, a lot of what I heard there is, it's probably a minority of people that for ideological reasons are gonna say, no, it has to be decentralized. I wanna use this infrastructure. There are other ideological reasons, or maybe not even ideology, but the, the trust and the verification, as you were mentioning, is another angle. But probably then the big one for users is, is it going to be cheaper if I use this? That's a bit of what you were just saying, Dalton. And a lot of these deep-in projects, their competition in Web2 are like these big cloud providers. And like the cloud's not real. It's just someone else's computer. And that someone is usually Jeff Bezos. So it's an economy of scale. There's a lot of these in data centers. So what are some ways that Deepin can be faster, you know, geography-based or cheaper in terms of just overall cost than these huge economies of scale that are like Google Cloud and stuff? Like, Yeah, so I can give an example. Sometimes it, it can't be cheaper. Um, but what, for Fleek, our first um, stab at uh, Fleek Network was purely a CDN play. We wanted to be a decentralized CDN. Um, the way uh, Cloudflare and these big players in the CDN market operate right now is uh, they, anyone is getting bandwidth 
down the road farther than Cloudflare. You can't beat Cloudflare in price on bandwidth. Uh, there isn't enough money on the table to really decentralize that. So we had to pivot a little bit more, and then we figured out, you know, edge functions, that's marked up about 80x. So now we can kind of decentralize uh, the CDN now by almost using the edge services and edge computes to kind of subsidize that cost because we really just can't beat them on cost in this area. Um, and yeah, other than that, uh, we're big on geographic location. I, uh, I think uh, a lot of deep end protocols can get a lot more nodes out there, a lot more coverage, uh, a lot easier than some of these centralized uh, entities have to play it because they have to front the cost for all of these servers. I think there's, I mean, there's, there's a couple of aspects here. One is the kind of the more theoretical aspect about a two-sided marketplace that can come up here. I mean, John said in the last panel, and hopefully I'm not going to steal your, your thunder here about, you know, StoreJ being the Airbnb for data, right? And so if you are able to utilize underutilized resources that are locked away in, in, in various areas, then there can be a way to create cost saving or value add from that. How do you balance that against economy of scale? That's the difficult bit because often economy of scale in the end does win, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that there's a blend of the two in the future. I'm hoping that even these, decent, uh, even these centralized, in this case, storage providers, for example, or centralized compute platforms can open up to the decentralized protocols to allow them to utilize some of their underutilized capacity. But I imagine they have capacity planning down to a T because that is their profit margin. So I'm sure they're pretty good at that. But there's also some areas where I think in, in the deep inside, the decentralized bit is more like noticeable, more physical. So think about things like um, some of the decentralized networks like Helium, for example, or um, Weather XM, which is a decentralized weather station like network. I mean, for a start, one, I want to get one of the Weather XM stations because that just sounds pretty cool, having your own weather station, right? Um, but that is a decentralized function, right? The weather here is different to the weather over there. So being able to get these hyper local readings um, in that case is very valuable, right? And it's not something you can do in a centralized fashion. You're trying to get these readings from different places. So being able to use something like a blockchain to record that data, a cryptocurrency to incentivize uh, you know, some kind of economic system by which people can be rewarded for supplying that hyper-local data, I think that is something that you can't do with a centralized system. So I think that's, that's an area where, where price is, is less sensitive, where you know, the functionality is more key. Yeah, I think we, we thought very carefully about how we can use the decentralized nature of our system to actually deliver better economies of scale, deliver better economics, deliver better performance. And you know, just to, as a quick aside, right? what we knew is that across data centers across, uh, around the world, most storage systems are less than 20% full. And you can fill up the remaining 80% without having to build any new data centers, do any more cooling, even use any additional electricity, or mine new rare uh, earth metals, build new uh, drives, et cetera. And so what we managed to build over time was the equivalent of several large data centers that are globally distributed that because of the way that we distribute the data, um, we're faster because we're able to be two to three times faster around the globe because we actually have data located near the edge. We're able to be radically cheaper because our cost, we aren't building data centers and the people who are running our nodes aren't uh, building new things either. They're just basically getting better utilization out of what they have. And because the data is uh, chopped up and not stored in any one place, you get better advantages in terms of durability, in terms of security, et cetera. So this was really a, a way to say, how can you use the ethos of, uh, and the structure of decentralization to deliver things that are fundamentally better from an economic standpoint, from a uh, security standpoint, from a durability standpoint. And now we can be 80% less expensive, 80% less carbon, and two to three times faster than AWS without having to spend billions of dollars. And it's a, it's a, a beautiful thing. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to win on speed or durability or security, but it, it's cool to know that there are ways that just the bottom line is cheaper too, which not all the time, but in certain cases, because the, uh, the scraps left over from the big tube companies are a lot more than scraps. There's a ton 
of inefficiency going on in these industries. So, so good to know that you know these distributed systems are winning in some of those spots. Uh, what I asked you in the beginning was, why do I care as a user? But I'd also like to know, why do I care as a builder? Which I think is particularly relevant because so many of these networks are modular. They just do one function, and then they'll interact with each other. Uh, you know, Fleek, for example, Dalton, you were saying, interacts with other deep in projects for some of the services it needs. It plugs into them. So as a builder, what is the appeal? What is the draw? And is it different from that of a user? Well, I, I, think, I think for a, a builder, you want to make sure that you can, you can deliver a complete solution to end users. And so knowing that you, know, you don't have to build everything that you know, AWS has, right? that you can partner with a, a live peer, as, as John said. Right? We're able to partner with live peer to deliver an end-to-end -end solution around video transcription and, and delivery, or to partner with an Akash, or partner with a Filecoin, um, or partner uh, with a Fleek. Right? I think that the fact that we can be open source and we can build levels of composability means ultimately we can deliver better solutions to end users. And so I think we should care. I think we should care because we have ideological uh, alignment, but also because we can build fundamentally better businesses and better products by, by having solutions that are, that are open. And uh, you know, I think the same design principles that allow us to be decentralized, I think also, almost by definition, should make us be composable with other services. I guess as well, the thing being is there's, there's different levels of this as to who your user is. For, for, for our example, for Filecoin, there's very few like end users using Filecoin directly because it is designed to store you know, very, very large amounts of data. I kind of equate it to it's a bit like a, a wholesale versus a retail operation, right? It's kind of like with a wholesale side and then there's third parties building like a retail side of it as well. So for example, Fleek store like some of their data on IPFS and Filecoin, right? So for us, you know, in terms of what does real world adoption for an end user look like, well, it's sitting next to me here as an example of that, right? So it, 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 it depends on who your users are because your users might not necessarily be obvious. They might not be who you think they are and they, they might be multiple levels deep, right? So it, you know, for us, it'd be like great to have obviously more utilization overall, how do we go about that? Do we incentivize end users or work towards end users or do we work with third parties that are building upon our system? So it's, it's you know, you've got to work out who that end user is to you. And there may be multiple answers to that. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Um, so in this scenario, we're, Fleek is a builder, um, but we're also a decentralized protocol ourselves. Be we're not a, but we're not a storage protocol. So we have Filecoin, IPFS. We, we don't really care what the underlying uh, storage layer is, but we're ready to leverage it. And now we can accelerate it. We can deliver it. Almost any protocol that uses content addressability, we can plug into um, because we're all, a lot of us are built on very similar primitives that make it really easy for us to interact together. Um, so yeah, so we, we as builders care because it makes other products, like the one we're building, possible, and more deep in uh, protocols possible. So this fits into the kind of modularity idea that's really popular when you look at L1 conversations and debates, like modular or monolithic. Should you split up functions, or should they all be vertically integrated in one chain? And this kind of fits into that sense of, hey, we're just going to do what we do and do it really well. But are there areas of the deep in world where it makes sense? I mean, it, is composability at risk with certain functions? Do you want to maybe combine a couple things under one umbrella? Or do you think you know, uh, your projects or others in the space, you know, for the most efficient use and then the best adoption from that, should they you know, stay specialized in one area? Can some of these be generalized? Um, yeah, so there's a lot to that. Um, question. I think there. I think it is good to conform on things that make sense. Like uh, um, IPFS has set a standard for uh, content addressability, and I think a lot of deep in protocols have realized the value in that. I don't think we have to conform, but I just think um, when we're all kind of playing the same game, we we all realize that certain things just make sense, and then a lot of us leverage that, and then in turn, it makes it us 
easier for us to interact with each other and build on top of each other. Yeah, as, uh, you know, as was said, it's like modularity at, at, at different levels. So you mentioned content addressability. Within Protocol Labs, we are a very decentralized uh, company and we have many, many different projects working on many different things. Like for example, LibP2P is an underlying peer-to-peer -peer library used by networks. It's used by about 30 different blockchains who you might ordinarily think of competitors to each other, but they're competing on a different level. But by using libp2p, it's like okay, that's that's that, you know, bit solved, right? Um, so that makes it it, it it much easier for them. So, but should things be combined? I guess this comes down. This is a, I mean, this is an engineering question. Computer science question has been going on back to the days of you know microkernels versus unikernels, right? This is an age-old like problem within computer science in general as to how you solve these things. And within protocol labs, there's certain things I've looked at and I've said, well, why don't we combine that and that? And the, the answer has been, we want to keep them deliberately separate, although that may seem or may actually be at this point in time less efficient. It allows a level of modularity and decoupling that will hopefully allow a more robust solution and ecosystem in the future because we don't necessarily know which part's going to win. So even within Protocol Labs, we have like competing products. I'll be there, I was like, well, why, why is Team A building this when Team B is also doing the same thing, right? Um, and because of the decentralized nature, there's going to be some competition, there's going to be some overlap, and we don't yet know what the best solution is going to be. This is still a very young field that we're building within, right? So keeping things decoupled and, and even in some cases intentionally introducing a level of like friction there by keeping them decoupled may actually help in the long term in terms of the, 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 the long term robustness of the ecosystem as a whole. But it, it can be painful. Yeah, I, I would say that I think if you look at the world of physical infrastructure in general, um, what distinguishes successful physical infrastructures from unsuccessful ones is that they have clean interfaces and that they can be adopted, right? I mean, nobody would drive on roads uh, if you have to have specialized tires, right? Uh, nobody would, would want to use uh, you know, power that couldn't come out of a, out of a standard, uh, standard outlet, right? And, and so I think that, as, certainly as we were designing, we said one of the most important things we can do is support the interfaces that are already out there. One of the most important things we could do to support uh, growth of Web 2 would be to support S3. We support IPFS, but we also wanted to support S3 because that's where the, uh, that's where the applications are right now. Right, and we wanted to make sure that um, people could build on top of us, that we could work well with other uh, decentralized projects, but also frankly work, plug in really nicely into an existing video solution or work with an existing healthcare solution. And right now we're attracting healthcare customers and financial customers um, and uh, universities and the reason we are is because we're easy to work with, right? And so I think, I think that you know, while we might wish we could capture more of the pie, Right now, we want to make sure that people can really interface with, interface well with us, right? And I think that if we're going to be infrastructure providers, we have to we have to be proud about the fact that people can build on top of us, almost by definition. Yeah, agree. One point we touched on there, or that was brought up in the, the answer to that question, was peer-to-peer -peer networks and competition. And typically, we might say with infrastructure. What, you know, what's the bottom line, what's the cheapest is one way, or the ideology, these are two dimensions of it, but because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, not everyone's just a user, a lot of people are participants. If you've got a gaming computer at home, you might rent out some compute. So there's now another angle to beating out the competition, which is friction of use of, you know, whether you want another decentralized protocol to be able to easily integrate with yours, or if you want end users to you know, have an easy time using it with crypto's famously bad UX. So I think one question in this sense might be, is how is that level of competition relevant for your respective protocols? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think that if you're building infrastructure where, you know, you don't know who all the uh, participants are, and you know that some of them can be hostile, um, that actually leads you, it, it's not easy, but it leads you to build better systems. It leads you to build more resilient systems. I mean, we have, you know, we in building storage had to build a system which would be 
uh, resilient even if large numbers of nodes went offline, right? Or even if uh, the nodes were being run by bad people. We know that for the most part we can send incentives so that most people are good, but not everybody is going to be good. And I think if you take that, that approach, you design systems that can say, hey, this should be able to survive a situation where large numbers of nodes go offline, or large, large numbers of nodes are run by bad people or by competitors. And if you, if you do that right, it's not easy, but you end up building something that's far more resilient. Because the truth is, there's no network in the world that, is, that has a, a, an impermeable uh, barrier, and um, people make mistakes, and machines fail, and if you build assuming that that's the case, you build something that's much stronger. In the like, blockchain and cryptocurrency world, we talk a lot about decentralization. We talk a lot about permissionless. We talk a lot about censorship resistance, right? And we've got a number of ideals like within this ecosystem that we try and achieve, right? Some to more ideological reasons, some to more pragmatic reasons, right? Now, what we're talking about with Deepin, ideally, we want a decentralized, permissionless, censorship resistant network that can withstand these failures, um, intentional or unintentional, um, that can you know, distribute the load, that can not be you know, taken down, all that kind of stuff. The world is a much more messier place than that and nowhere near able to meet those ideals at the moment. So to give a concrete example, Filecoin, if you are a storage provider in the US and you're a registered business, you know, you're a, a legit business with a big data center full of storage capacity, um, you can't be doing business with an entity in North Korea, right? Legally, right? OFAC regulations, you cannot be dealing with an entity in North Korea. So how do you have a permissionless system by which you can allow anybody to use your system, but, oh, but not them, right? So this starts to come into, into this, once we have these ideal, there's then the realities of, okay, we're gonna need some sort of KYC system, or we're gonna need to gatekeep slightly, or we're, we're only gonna take storage deals from entities which we, we, we know, right? And we've, we've had some relationship with. So I think that's, that's the area where some of this gets a little bit messy. Right? And then especially when we're talking about content, you can talk about stuff like objectionable content that maybe you know, morally, legally, you don't want on your network. And then you start hitting into the whole thing of, well, hey, everybody should be able to use it. Well, everybody who I think is okay, right? Well, you, know, you start getting into some really gray areas very quickly, right? Um, so it, it is difficult. And I think Deepin is, you know, that is a particularly big aspect with Deepin because you're generally talking about utilization of physical resources, right? Be it storage, be it network capacity, be it compute capacity, whatever it might be. Um, so you, you potentially, whilst you want it to be available for everybody, you know, in a completely permissionless way, the chances are you're going to have to do some measure of control of that as much as we might hate to admit it, that's gonna be the case. Um, and how we, how we achieve that is, is a difficult thing. Um, yeah, so I, all of all of that is extremely relevant um, I th uh, in Deepin. But to answer your question in a different way of, like, how do I keep friction down and keep people using us? Uh, one of the approaches I've taken, and it was kind of touched on earlier about uh, how you support S3 because that's where the apps are at. Uh, what what we wanted to do when we supported these uh, all these flavors of compute that we wanted to offer is we wanted to make sure that. Whatever they already had running on centralized stuff, um, they could bring over and use it on us. They wouldn't have to learn some domain-specific language to use us. And they wouldn't have to use uh, just things that would keep the developer friction down to keep developers wanting to use us where it's a viable option to say, hey, just swap this in. Um, and uh, it just is, it's an easier pitch to developers. And I think it gives us use. Um, I think it gives us uh, more developer use, easier. Um, but yeah. Yeah, support the interoperability. So let's take a short look into the future and we're gonna say we have hit the pinnacle of adoption. What does that look like when we have, you know, Google Cloud capitulates and they're using decentralized storage and supporting it and Vercel bows down to Fleek? Like what does what the, the pinnacle of adoption look like? Um, I think from a user standpoint, it just looks like a really fast internet. Everything's cheap. We have really cool stuff. 
and no one even knows that they're using decentralized uh, infra. I think that's, from a user perspective, I think that's, uh, I, I think it from, it's not gonna look much different, just faster and cheaper. I think from a builder perspective, I think it opens up a lot of doors. I think it could unlock a lot of compute, a, a lot of resources that wouldn't really be feasible for your little app. Um, and I think the possibilities are endless. And I, honestly, I don't know, I'm kind of excited um, to see once we're done building this, like what people do build on top of this and what, what they, uh, how creative they can get. Exactly, if, if we're successful, ultimately you won't know because you won't see us, right? And, and that's, that's the paradox, right? It's like, can anybody here tell me the name of the company that makes the pipes under their sink that connect their faucet up to the main supply? No. no. You might be able to tell me the name of the people that make the faucet because maybe you went down to the store and you chose that particular one because you wanted that, you know, aesthetically, you wanted that design. So you might be able to tell me that. You won't be able to tell me who makes the pipes, right? But there's a company out there making the pipes. They're probably maybe a very successful company. They might turn over millions, billions, I don't know, right? They're some company extruding plastic and, you know, they're, they're doing a good job and everybody's buying from them, I guess, and, you know, delivering water, but you don't know who it is. And ultimately, if we're successful, I see us in that, that position. You won't know whether you're using Filecoin or StoreJ or you know, any of the other like, you know, decentralized networks. You don't know, you know whether you're going directly through something like Fleek for your storage. You, you just bring up your browser or, well, your neural interface, I suppose it'll be, um, and, and you'll access the content. And you, you won't even know. And that's, I think, the ultimate hallmark of success is we suddenly completely disappear. Um, which as a developer advocate uh, kind, of, kind of means I've got to you know, start learning yak herding or something like that instead. Um, but ultimately, that'll be, that'll be what success looks like, I think. Yeah, I, I think that, that those, those points are absolutely right. I mean, it, it, just to give it a, another analogy, right? It, um, as we are uh, talking, as we're using networks, nobody knows which routers, which bridges, uh, things are going over, who's running them, and you don't care. And that wasn't the case 30 years ago. 30 years ago, things were controlled by the telcos. And yet, because we took a decentralized approach to the fundamentals of the internet, uh, we had orders and orders of magnitude uh, improvements in terms of costs and in terms of availability and the ability to tie, to reach corners of the world that were never reached before, right? And I think we can do the same thing with the rest of the cloud uh, computing infrastructure. And if we do it right, I think what we'll see is that we are orders of magnitude cheaper, orders of magnitude faster, orders of magnitude more accessible to people who right now don't have uh, access, uh, and if we do it right, things will be utilized a lot more efficiently, and so we'll be a lot more environmentally friendly as well. Because again, it's a it's a crying shame that 20%, you know, most infrastructure is only 20% used, and uh, you could utilize it, uh, utilize that remaining 80% without mining more rare earth minerals or spending more money on uh, cooling or power or building new data centers, and I think that's a lot of the promise that we have we as an industry can bring. There you have it. When DPIN wins, the user won't even know it happened because everything will be working. You won't think about the infrastructure. Uh, the only sign that it won will be that my panelists won't be here. They'll all be on their private islands instead when uh, it takes over and becomes the primary use case. I think that's about the time we have for this panel, so I'm going to let each of you give a closing statement. You know, if you want to say anything cool that's coming out uh, from the projects you're working on, what you're interested in, just a quick word on the way out. Um, so yeah, in terms of cool stuff that's coming out, uh, within Filecoin, we are uh, releasing a system called Interplanetary Consensus, which is a scalability layer for Filecoin that allows you to build recursively layer two, layer three, layer four blockchains off of the main Filecoin network. Um, and a lot more flexibility for customization uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have on, say, the main network. Uh, so that's one of the things we're working on. Um, you know, come find me if that's, if that's of interest. Uh, myself and my colleagues are speaking at a bunch of events over the next week, and we're involved in the, the hackathon. We've got a, uh, some bounties at the hackathon as well um, here. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a uh, mainnet coming out for Fleek Network by the end of the year. Right now we just finished up uh, uh, a phase of our test net and we have some interesting metrics coming out on our serverless compute. I think they're being published tomorrow. Um, so yeah, check us out. Uh, 
if you're interested in getting involved, uh, running a node once we go live or anything like that, uh, just check us out on our website, fleek.network. Uh, yeah, so, so a lot of thing, interesting things are happening at, at Storage A. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we are now uh, two to three times faster than AWS uh, on a global basis. Uh, we should have another stair step function uh, in the next several months. Uh, we should also have some stair step functions in terms of economics as well. But perhaps uh, most exciting is we now have a really large and growing customer base, and lots of, people, lots of them are willing to share what they've been able to do in order to take advantage of this. So really encourage you to come learn more about how we're working, and also uh, um, we're working with a pretty large cross-section of the folks in the DPN space as well, because I think what we're finding is that it's, uh, you know, when, a, when a Storage A and a, and a Live Peer and an Akash um, uh, work together, really amazing things can happen. Yeah, we got some big things coming. Thank you to everyone who came to listen, and uh, let's give a round for our speakers.